Hello, everyone. I'm Olympia. Thank you for being here with me in this wonderful place called Lights Out Library. And I have a great story to tell you. In 79 AD, in the dark of night, the inhabitants of Pompeii in the south of Italy slumbered in their beds. The nearby volcano, Mount Vesuvius, which dominated the city's horizon and had recently begun casting out small stones and ash in fits and spurts, suddenly released a burst of very hot clouds of ash. These clouds traveled at high speeds, too fast for anyone in their path to escape and too hot to survive. Several Roman towns and cities on or near the Gulf of Naples were hit and their inhabitants taken by surprise. Two cities, Pompeii and Herculaneum, were entirely engulfed in the shroud of burning ash and gas. And within a few hours, as the eruption raged on, residents were buried under several meters of ash. The Romans attempted rescue efforts, but it was too late. Inhabitants still present at the time of the disaster and the two cities disappeared from the map. News of the tragedy traveled all across Italy and around the Roman Empire, provoking shock and grief, but as it happens, years passed and time began to bury the memory of Pompeii and Herculaneum. Like the cities themselves had been buried in volcanic ash, Decades passed, then generations, and the names of the two cities now only appeared in accounts and obscure records that most people were not aware of. When the Western Royal Empire fell four centuries later, all records and memories of that horrible night in Pompeii were lost. A millennium passed. New kingdoms appeared in the south of Italy, and life went on, oblivious to the existence of the dead city that hid under just twenty feet of soil. That is, until it was rediscovered. Better preserved than any other ancient Roman city. Pompeii in time came to reveal treasures, troves of information about Roman urbanism and daily life. Tonight, we're going to travel to ancient towns or cities that have known similar fate. They were not always buried underground. Others were overwhelmed by the jungle, forgotten in the sand, and were just abandoned in a remote region, and they were rediscovered centuries later. Apart from Pompeii, we will go to Asia and the city of Angkor in Cambodia, to Africa and the remains of Great Zimbabwe, the name given to the ancient capital of the Kingdom of Zimbabwe, and to the United States to explore a dwelling in Colorado called Cliff Palace, also known as Mesa Verde, after the National Park where it is located. It was built by ancestral Puebloans. These places and their history were not always entirely lost. Sometimes the locals living nearby knew about the ruins, but they all rose to fame and their historical significance 
and the extent or the beauty of the remains was exposed to the world. Each of them has a story that I will tell you. As always, you do not need to watch the video to follow along. If you wish, you may close your eyes and only focus on the sound of my voice as we embark on this adventure together. If you are so kind, please subscribe to my channel and click the like button. This helps support the channel and limits ads as much as possible. Please also follow us on Facebook for announcements. If you fall asleep and wish to resume the video later, or jump directly to one of these stories, timestamps are listed below. Also below, you will find links to different streaming options like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music. But before we begin, assume a comfortable position. Take a long, deep, relaxing breath. When you exhale, release the tension in your shoulders. Release the tension in your facial muscles and allow the sound of my voice to guide you through this journey. Let's begin tonight's journey by continuing our exploration of Pompeii. I already told you how, in a matter of hours, the city was buried under suffocating layers of ash. This happened in the first century, when Pompeii was not a small town, it had a population estimated 20,000 people. This was a considerable figure for a city in the antiquity. It was much less than Rome, to be sure, with its hundreds of thousands of citizens. But Pompeii was still important and prosperous with all the characteristics and conveniences of a modern Roman city. Main avenues converging to a forum, a public square of sorts, temples, baths, an arena and many houses, large and small. All the refinements of Roman life were available to the residents of Pompeii a reflection of the thriving and growing Roman Empire. But Pompeii existed long before Rome emerged as a superpower. The city was founded about at the same time as Rome, in the 8th century BC, by the Oscans from central Italy. Shortly after, this settlement entered into the orbit of the Hellenic people from Greece. The Greeks were exploring the Mediterranean Sea and establishing small colonies around the region, together with the Phoenicians in the 6th century BC. The city flourished. Its surroundings were fertile because there were volcanic ashes and this was one of the reasons of its prosperity due to the presence of the volcano nearby. Ironically, this would also cause its disappearance centuries later. Maritime trade by the Greeks and the Phoenicians also benefited Pompeii, and a small port was built near the mouth of the river Sarno, on which Pompeii was located. The town was progressively turning from a small settlement into a prosperous little city. In the 6th century BC, the dominant force in Italy was the Etruscans, who rarely conquered cities militarily. They controlled them and Pompeii entered 
the Etruscan orbit just as the young city of Rome had. Pompeii had Etruscan kings for a period. The market square that would later become their forum was built, as well as a temple to Apollo, a cult introduced by Greeks. But this early prosperity didn't last. In the 5th and 4th century BC, for reasons that are not precisely known, large areas of the city were abandoned and control of Pompeii changed hands. The Entruscus had declined, and they were replaced with the Samnites, an Italic people allied to Rome, until this alliance was broken, and a series of wars, the Samnite Wars, raged in the south of Italy. After these wars, Pompeii fell under the influence of Rome. It still had an autonomy, but became an increasingly Romanized city and was allied to Rome. Under Rome's protection, Pompeii once again bloomed, expanding beyond its previous boundaries. Many public and private buildings were added during this time, including an area for performances, an audion, an audion in ancient Greek, and Roman cities was a separate building dedicated to music. It resembled a theater, but was smaller and had a roof for acoustic purposes. Apart from cultural facilities, a temple to Jupiter was also built, the Basilica. In Roman cities, the Basilica was a large public building for gatherings of all sorts with multiple functions. The term Basilica became associated with churches centuries later because many churches in the Roman world adopted the same layout. A central nave flanked by aisles, separated by rows of columns, and some basilicas were later converted into churches. Rome was a republic, and in the first century BC, it had emerged as the new superpower of the Mediterranean world. But Rome didn't govern all of its provinces in the same manner. Having not yet adapted to its political structures to match its new size, many Italian cities that were quite close to Rome geographically, which had been allied to it for decades or even centuries, were vassals with a bit of autonomy, but with none of the rights enjoyed by Roman citizens. Several cities revolted at the beginning of the first century BC, including Pompeii, having grown tired of being second-class allies to Rome, but without any of the status and influence or the right to vote in the Republic that came with Roman citizenship. These revolts were repressed militarily by the Roman army, and many cities were crushed. Pompeii was besieged and captured by the army, but ultimately after prominent rebels were dispossessed of their properties, the inhabitants of Pompeii were granted citizenship. The Roman Republic expanded its citizenship beyond the limits of the city of Rome to the rest of Italy, and these cities were now fully integrated into the Roman world. 
Pompeii became a fully Roman city. It had already been culturally Roman, but was now politically as well. As an official colony of Rome, Pompeii was similarly socially organized, with the same set of laws and same citizenship, at least for those individuals who were lucky enough to not be enslaved and to have at least a few possessions. That remained true in Pompeii. Like in the rest of the Roman world, at least until Vesuvius erupted. There was also a large population of enslaved men, women, and children, foreigners, and, of course, female citizens who didn't enjoy the same status and privileges as male citizens. This short war at the beginning of the first century B.C., didn't stop Pompeii from growing and becoming a cultural center in the region. The century and a half prior to the tragedy caused by the eruption were probably the best, most prosperous times the city had ever enjoyed. It was an important portal for goods in the south of Italy. More buildings were constructed, including an amphitheater, while others were enlarged, refurbished, or both. Pompeii had more entertainment venues than any other city in the region, not only for high culture, but also for the masses, including taverns or brothels, a common part of daily life for the Romans who lived in cities. The population continued to rise and reached 20,000 in the first century A.D. The Pax Romana, the Roman peace, was firmly entrenched, and the ravages of war were no longer to be feared. The city was wealthy, and its prominent families lived and enjoyed the Roman way of life while living relatively close to Rome, which was the center of the largest empire the world had ever seen. In 64 AD, the emperor, who at the time was Nero, even visited Pompeii. The entire region around the Gulf of Naples was peaceful and prosperous, and its inhabitants were accustomed to the minor earthquakes. Mount Vesuvius, which dominated the horizon, emitted a constant column of black smoke. But this had been the case for centuries. Nothing more than the occasional minor quake had been recorded prior to February of 62. Seventeen years before the disaster of Pompeii and Herculaneum, a more severe earthquake shook the entire region around the Gulf and caused serious damages in Pompeii. Some buildings had to be repaired. Fine frescoes inside the homes of the wealthy were repainted. Broken housewares were replaced. Life then returned to normal or even improved for some because several wealthy families took the repairs as an opportunity to install the latest Roman refinements like in-home heating systems and window glass. In 79 AD, in the late summer or autumn, Mount Vesuvius woke from its long sleep. That year, one of the most violent eruptions ever recorded in European history began, and it lasted for two days. On the first day, for more than ten miles around the volcano, 
small rocks rained down from the erupting crater. This lasted for 18 hours and was alarming enough that likely at least some inhabitants decided to evacuate. This is based on the limited number of victims found centuries later under the ashes. But in this early stage, even though the air was filled with ash and small rocks fell everywhere, it was not life-threatening. Many inhabitants likely hoped it would pass and decided to remain. The first phase did indeed end, but sadly, it was followed by even worse events. Overnight or early the next morning, the eruption turned explosive as a cloud of heated gases, dust, and fragments of rock erupted so high into the sky that it reached the stratosphere. Molten rock and hot ash in massive amounts were projected throughout and blanketed the area. More than a million tons per second when the eruption reached its explosive phase. The energy released all at once, by Vesuvius, was equivalent to dozens of exploding atomic bombs. Such violent eruptions, which release massive amounts of energy and quantities of material in a relatively short period of time, have since been dubbed Vesuvian after Mount Vesuvius. Vesuvian eruptions are far more deadly and harder to escape than slower eruptions that release lava over a longer period of time. Worst of all for the inhabitants of Pompeii, though, was the deadly heat and dust wave released by the volcano. This flowing mixture of burning gas and rock fragments, it's called a pyroclastic surge, which reaches on average speeds of 100 miles per hour, but can sometimes travel as fast as several hundred miles per hour. In other words, a pyroclastic surge cannot be outrun. And considering that Pompeii was a mere five miles from Vesuvius, the surge would have reached it almost instantly. Those who remained in Pompeii were killed even before they knew what had happened. Their houses, their temples, their whole city and everything in it was covered in a thick, and growing layer of ash. Roofs collapsed in heavy rains, and up to 20 feet of volcanic material entombed what two days prior had been a vibrant city. In the days following the eruption, once the sky cleared of dust and ash, a relief effort was organized to find any survivors, but it was too late. Maybe a few survivors emerged, those who had evacuated outside the blast zone, or looters had already approached the site. But all that could be seen were the tops of only the higher buildings here and there. But in essence, Pompeii was gone. The once thriving city was buried too deep, its surviving inhabitants too few to clean and rebuild what remained. The site was abandoned and memories of the tragedy began to fade away. Many generations later, in the 5th century, 
further eruptions of Mount Vesuvius dropped even more ash and rock on the site, making it disappear for good. The Roman Empire had collapsed, and any memories of Pompeii only survived in Roman archives that no one studied anymore. For centuries, hidden under ash that had turned into soil, Pompeii awaited its rediscovery. While the eruption had damaged the city, the quick accumulation of material had protected a lot of fixed elements, including frescoes on the walls and works of art, freezing them in time. Organic elements like foods or the bodies of victims decomposed and, after disappearing, left behind cavities like molds that would later be filled with plaster to reveal their shapes to archaeologists. The city may have been found for the first time at the end of the 16th century by workers digging an underground aqueduct nearby, but it didn't draw any attention and the city kept its secrets for another century. The real discovery and exploration began in the 18th century, not only of Pompeii, but its sister city, Herculaneum, which had known the same fate. The site itself was so vast that it has still not been entirely unearthed. Some parts of Pompeii remain underground to this day for purposes of preservation. The lack of air and moisture allows little to no deterioration of the structures and artifacts contained within the cemented ash, whereas exposing them would immediately risk deterioration by the climate or human activity. Pompeii became famous once it was unearthed in the 18th century, and its discovery contributed to the renewed interest in Roman antiquity. Neoclassical style was about to emerge, and Pompeii provided inspiration. The ruins also challenged the idea of antiquity that scholars or the educated had at the time about values of people living in ancient times. A lot of erotic art and materials were discovered at Pompeii, frescoes and statues that shocked the more prudish mentalities of the 18th and 19th centuries. The facts of Pompeii did not at all fit an idealized image of Roman antiquity as a period of restraint that was not sexualized at all. So many of the artifacts were kept hidden for a long time, but this was not the first or the last Time that archaeological finds challenged preconceptions and were thus rejected as unacceptable. Another example is with Greek statues. Many Greek statues and temples were actually painted and colorful. We know it because paint pigments have been found on them. But the image of Greek antiquity that the Western world had created and that still exists to a large extent nowadays is that of an ancient Greek aesthetic made of white marble sobriety that evokes perfection and elegance. The idea that they could be covered in flashy colors and that the Greeks had a tacky taste based on modern standards, which does seem funny 
is unacceptable. So the way Greek antiquity, the ancient Greeks' aesthetics, is put on display, from museums to movies, is very much influenced by the idealized vision of it, or partially the fantasy that was elaborated in the past centuries. But archaeology has progressed a lot, and conceptions can change. For example, nowadays, the depiction of sexuality in the ancient Roman society has become almost a cliché in films or novels. But in the 18th or 19th centuries, that was almost unthinkable, and it would have been a stain on an idealized past. The ruins of Pompeii are now open to the public, and this provides probably the best place in the world to visualize and experience firsthand what a Roman city was like in the first century, from its monuments and public spaces to private homes. The roofs are missing, but the layout of the streets, the colonnades, the decorative elements that have all been frozen in the past for almost 2,000 years, create an extraordinary and moving experience. Our second story of the night takes us far from Italy to East Asia, another wonderful city that was also buried, this time not by ashes, but by the jungle. Angkor. As opposed to Pompeii's 20,000 inhabitants in the first century, Angkor was on a different scale. It may have had 750,000 to 1 million inhabitants at the time of its splendor during the European Middle Ages. This would have made it one of the largest pre-industrial cities in the world. Angkor is located in Cambodia, a small country between Thailand and Vietnam. But the map of this region has changed considerably over time and has been redrawn by the rise and fall of several kingdoms and later by colonization. From the 9th to the 15th centuries, Cambodia was at the center of the Khmer Empire, which extended well beyond its modern borders, and Angkor was its capital. The empire began modestly. It was founded near the site of Angkor as a small kingdom at the beginning of the 9th century and it expanded regularly with periods of conquest, as well as a few setbacks. Until it reached its peak, its golden age, in the 12th and 13th centuries. After that, it entered a long period of decline. The exact reasons for which are not known with certainty, and may include religious conflicts. The kingdom began as a Hinduist, but later a growing part of the population and some kings converted to Buddhism, or it could have been due to foreign pressure or an ecological breakdown by droughts followed by violent floods that decrease agriculture production. The Great Plague of the 14th century could have also contributed. The plague started in China around 1330 and traveled westward all the way to Europe that it reached in 1345. And on its way, it decimated populations all across Asia. In any case, Angkor was progressively 
abandoned. It fell to the neighboring kingdom of Ayutthaya, the precursor to modern Thailand, and by the 15th century almost no one remained in what was previously one of the largest, most populated cities in the world. Thousands of buildings, including large temples, all the irrigation system and the roads were overwhelmed by the forest. The gigantic city disappeared, swallowed up by trees and vines. Only its largest and most spectacular temple, Angkor Wat, remained visible and was maintained by a few people until archaeologists began to unveil the scale of the site, more than 400 years after it had been abandoned. What makes Angkor extraordinary is the profusion and beauty of its temples. There are hundreds of them, some vast, others no bigger than a smaller house. The Khmers were incredible builders. It has been estimated that the site of Angkor contains more stone than all the monuments of ancient Egypt combined, including the pyramids. During its rise and golden age, the Khmer Empire was extremely wealthy thanks to productive agriculture and a large population. They had mastered irrigation, and the Angkor site reflects this, with remnants of a complex system of canals that distributed water all across the site. Today, only structures made of stone remain, temples and a few bridges, but there were once thousands and thousands of houses including the king's residence, made of perishable materials like wood. This is similar to other ancient civilizations like Egypt, for example, for which the use of stone was limited to religious buildings. The rest mostly disappeared. Angkor had a low population density but a large geographical footprint. With the help of satellite imaging and research on the ground, the urban sprawl of Angkor has been estimated to cover at least 400 square miles, and there are several architectural wonders within this area that deserve a quick description. The largest and the most famous structure is Angkor Wat, a temple complex that was initially dedicated to the god Vishnu from the Hinduist pantheon. But as I said earlier, there were various religious influences in Khmer Empire, and Buddhism gradually replaced Hinduism. So by the end of the 12th century, Angkor Wat was transformed into a Buddhist temple, and its shape and architecture reflect the golden age of Khmer art. It is called a temple mountain due to its resemblance to a mountain range, with its central structure peaking at an elevation of more than 200 feet. The central mountain is constructed entirely of ornamented stone and surrounded with rectangular galleries, each rising higher than the next. With this design, the monument projects both power and harmony. It is perfectly symmetrical. This mountain shape is a representation of Mount Meru in Hindu and Buddhist traditions. Mount Meru is a symbolic sacred mountain with five peaks, 
considered to be the center of the physical and spiritual universe, a place where dimensions meet, and is mythical in the sense that it doesn't refer to a particular identified location on earth. But many temples, well beyond the Khmers in India and Southeast Asia, reproduced this sacred shape with its central elevations to represent the mountain. Angkor Wat is the only monument in the city that was never actually abandoned and never lost. It was occupied and maintained as much as possible by a small Buddhist community, but they didn't have the means to preserve and restore it. In the 16th century, Angkor Wat was visited and described by Portuguese travelers. But archaeologists arriving in the 19th century, while astonished by the spectacular monument, also noted that it was in bad condition, with the forest having invaded parts of the complex. Since then, Angkor Wat has been restored and cared for and has become a national symbol for Cambodia. Another temple that is spectacular, but for different reasons, is Ta Pram, founded in the 12th century as well. This was formerly a Buddhist monastery and a center of knowledge, a type of university. But unlike the other large temples at Angkor, this one was left in much the same condition in which it was found. Large trees grow out of the ruins. Their roots run everywhere, seeming to embrace what remains of the temple, whether to hide or protect it. The scene of Ta Prom, as a result, is very atmospheric, almost eerie, as opposed to the temple mountains like Angkor Wat, Ta Pram is flat, with five successive enclosing walls that surround a central sanctuary. The outer wall encloses a very large area, large enough to have supported a substantial town in the past, but the area is now covered in forest. The site is believed to have been once home to more than 12,000 people, with an additional 80,000 in surrounding villages working just to support the temple, providing supplies and services. Yet another temple is called the Bayon, not as large and not as high as Angkor Wat. This temple is still impressive, but it also has a prominent central elevation, and this one covered in a multitude of serene, smiling stone faces. They covered the structure's towers and its central peak, watching in every direction. Buddhists, from its inception, this temple reveals a more Baroque style of Khmer architecture. It has about 200 faces in total that might represent the king, the temple's founder, or the Bodhisattva of compassion. In Buddhism, the Bodhisattva is a person who is on the path of Buddhahood, that is to say, to awakening in nirvana, the ultimate spiritual goal in Buddhism. This is as much an example of a spiritual path to follow as it is a sign of hope for those who follow the teachings of the original Buddha. Apart from the heads, the temple is very richly decorated with a profusion of bas relief of shallow carvings and inscriptions that depict everything 
from everyday life to historical events to scenes from Hindu mythology. This despite the temple being Buddhist. This is a testimony to how religious beliefs mixed and coexist in Angkor. Since the empire had both Buddhist and Hindu kings, who successively founded new temples and ordered changes and renovations, creating this variety of sanctuaries with different styles, their different shapes, and their different ornamentations. I mentioned earlier that Angkor was never entirely lost, because Angkor Wat was occupied continuously and its existence was known to the local Khmer. The discovery, rather, was of the extent of the site, its variety of structures and its historical significance that were rediscovered starting in the 19th century. The site remained cloaked by the forest until the end of the century and was progressively explored over several decades, eventually rising to global fame in the 20th century. In 1931, a colonial exposition was held in Paris, where different French colonies were represented with pavilions. The colony of French Indochina of which Cambodia had become a part, had a massive reproduction of Angkor Wat as its pavilion. The pavilion became the popular symbol of the exposition, bringing attention to Angkor Wat in the West. As the 20th century progressed, Restoration and study of the sites had to be suspended several times, first during the Second World War and then again during the regime of the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia. In the past 30 years, though, rehabilitation and study of Angkor have resumed in earnest, and the site has received a growing number of visitors. Tourism brings its own challenges, primarily for the preservation and integrity of the site, but is also a major source of income for Cambodia. And the scale of the site, which, as I said, is very large, means that the density of tourists is not enough to distract from its fantasy-like atmosphere. Angkor remains a city of dreams. For our third city tonight, we're going to travel several thousand miles to Zimbabwe in southern Africa during the European late Middle Ages when Angkor was flourishing in Cambodia, another kingdom the Kingdom of Zimbabwe rose to prominence in the south of Africa, which eventually left behind the ruins of its capital, now called Great Zimbabwe. This was a major political and trade center that dominated the region until the 15th century. Its study by archaeologists also revealed a wealth of local crafts, and also imported artifacts such as Chinese porcelain and Arabian coins, indicating that the city was connected to trade routes that extended far to the north, to Arabia, and to the east. Zimbabwe is a term from the Shona language and it could mean houses of stone or venerated houses. The country now called Zimbabwe reclaimed its name after winning independence, and the Shona ethnic group that forms the majority of the population. 
In Zimbabwe, their Shona ancestors founded several kingdoms in the region, and they have a specific language, the Shona language, but are also part of a wider cultural area and group of languages called Bantu. There are hundreds of Bantu languages and dialects in the southern third of Africa, from Cameroon to South Africa. Almost a third of the population has a Bantu language as their mother tongue. But this doesn't mean they can easily communicate with each other in their native languages, because each language diverged over time. All Bantu languages descend from the common proto-language, which is believed to have been spoken in what is now Cameroon in Central Africa. At least 3,000 to 2,500 years ago, more exact dates are still being debated. Speakers of this ancient language began a series of migrations to the east and to the south, carrying their culture and architectural practices with them. They had a strong influence in the regions where they arrived, at least linguistically, and Bantu peoples came to occupy a big part of Africa south of the Sahara, with a lot of diversity. There are several hundred Bantu ethnic groups that spread from Central Africa to Southern Africa. Bantu languages with the most speakers are Swahili, which is spoken in the East, especially around the African Great Lakes and often serves as a second language for communication between different nationalities or communities in this region. Followed by Zulu, the east of South Africa, and then Shona. The formation of states in Southern Africa is not very well documented because there was no writing system, so a lot of the history we have comes from oral tradition. But this is not always reliable after dozens of generations and can make it hard to precisely date events or locate sites. Archaeology, thankfully, helps to fill some of the gaps providing factual elements. Archaeological excavations in the region suggest that the formation of states in Zimbabwe began before the rise of this medieval kingdom of Zimbabwe. For example, the Great Zimbabwe site had been previously occupied as early as the 7th century, 500 years earlier. There were also subsequent kingdoms after the fall of Great Zimbabwe, and likely one of the contributing factors to its fall, came the kingdom of Mutaba, which is better documented by outside sources because of contact with the Portuguese in the 16th century. Mutaba extended far beyond modern Zimbabwe, it had a vast territory in what are now Zambia, Mozambique, and South Africa, in addition to Zimbabwe. But what makes this kingdom of Zimbabwe from the Middle Ages and its capital stand out is the large stone structures that it left behind. Urbanization only happens when agriculture is productive enough to support a non-agricultural population, as well as the building of large structures. This requires an accumulation of wealth 
which is what happened in Zimbabwe during this period. The capital was able to be supported by abundant food production, especially from cattle. It received taxes or tributes from dozens of lesser rulers in the region, who also had their own minor Zimbabwe's and left behind ruins on a smaller scale. Great Zimbabwe controlled the very lucrative gold and ivory trades to the coast on the Indian Ocean. They traded with a coastal kingdom named Kilwa along the coast of Africa that connected Great Zimbabwe to international trade routes originating in China and the Muslim world in the Middle East, which explains the discovery of artifacts that came from other parts of the world. The building of Great Zimbabwe spanned over 300 years. Its largest structure is referred to as the Great Enclosure, which is a circular structure with very high stone walls as high as 36 feet of dry stone, which must have made this building an impregnable fortress. Maybe it served as a royal palace or a stronghold of sorts. Apart from the great enclosure, the site includes an older group of ruins called the Hill Complex, which appears to have been abandoned in the 13th century. Maybe it was like an earlier center of the city until it was replaced with newer buildings. There are also several groups of ruins called the Valley Complex, where apparently the city's center moved in the later period. It is unclear whether these different sectors corresponded to different functions like religious political or economic, for example, or whether they were palaces built by successive kings to leave their mark on the city. Among the numerous artifacts found in the ruins, several stand out. There are these imported goods that reveal the existence of trade connections, as well as elaborate items made locally with ivory, iron, gold, or copper, items like weapons and jewelry. The most notable artifacts are eight statues of birds carved from stone, the Zimbabwe birds, which have become the national emblem of modern Zimbabwe. Their exact function is not known, it seems they were made to be placed on top of a monolith, and it is thought they represent eagles that were protective spirits and messengers of the gods in Shona culture. We'll now leave Africa and continue our tour to the American West in the state of Colorado. We find the breathtaking city built into the side of a cliff, Mesa Verde, or Cliff Palace. Cliff Palace is the largest of several dwellings built by Native Americans in North America, and it is contemporary to Angkor and Great Zimbabwe. Mesa Verde was built and inhabited in the 12th and 13th centuries by the ancestral Puebloans 700 years before the founding of the state of Colorado. Who were they? Among the different ancient Native American cultures, the ancestral Puebloans lived between four states of the modern U.S. Utah, Arizona, New Mexico, and Colorado, but only from the 8th to the 14th century, because in the 14th century, 
ancestral Puebloans who lived in Utah and Colorado abandoned their settlements and migrated south. In the 17th century, they settled mostly in New Mexico, where the majority of their descendants now live, Pueblo peoples, with smaller communities in Texas and Arizona. But the history of the Pueblo people started long before that and can be traced as a specific culture with enough characteristics to separate them from other groups since at least the 8th century. At that time, they had a lifestyle based on agriculture, combined with hunting and gathering, and they developed an early style of architecture with characteristic villages that were crescent-shaped or in straight rows, made of houses with flat roofs aligned close to one another. These villages, called pueblos in Spanish, are the reason they were given this name by the Spanish as they explored North America. From the 10th to the 12th century, Puebloans made their villages and dwellings from stone and mortar, and their architecture diversified. With towers or small dams to retain and use water, villages became larger and houses sometimes gained a second floor. In the 12th century, also called the Great Pueblo Period, they also developed these large cliff dwellings that might have served as defensive places to hide and protect their harvest, because at the same time, they had communities built out in the open with now multi-storied villages that used a variety of materials, stone, wood, natural fibers, and adobe. These cliff dwellings were built in shallow caves and under rock overhangs and canyons. Puebloans leveled the ground, sometimes removing rock to enlarge the dwelling area, and used the space to build a village inside the cliffs. Stones were shaped and walls were made thick enough to support multiple stories. Circulation in these villages was as much vertical as it was horizontal. The entrance door to houses were generally on the second floor. And there were ventilation holes with ladders, like stairways inside houses. Floors were made of wood and interiors were often decorated with petroglyphs, that is to say signs carved in stone or paintings. Like villages out in the open, cliff dwellings had a public space, a plaza, in front of the houses where women could grind corn, men would make tools, and children would play. Mesa Verde is the largest of these dwellings, and its main building material is sandstone. Mesa Verde is believed to have had a population of about a hundred people living in a hundred and fifty rooms. But beyond its modest population, it is also believed to have been at the center of a larger community that included smaller surrounding villages, making it a small social and political center. One question raised by these cliff dwellings is, why go to the trouble of building such structures when the majority of the ancestral Puebloans lived in regular villages? It could have been for protection against intruders, because in the 13th century, climatic conditions may have worsened in the region and reduced food production, leading to conflicts. Villages were probably very vulnerable to attacks and could be attacked from any side. 
whereas cliff dwellings were much harder to invade and maybe gave a sense of security. Tree ring dating from the wood they used in the construction of Mesa Verde indicates that the site was occupied for approximately 70 years in the 13th century. Around 1300, the settlement was abandoned, along with others, as the ancestral Puebloans left Colorado. This could have been due to several years of drought that pushed them to look for more welcoming areas to the south. Starting in the 12th century, and for about 300 years, North America was hit by a long period of drought, which is believed to have caused the collapse or the transformation of different ancient Native American cultures, not just the Puebloans. The Mississippian cultural area to the east was also strongly affected. It experienced more warfare and migrations during this period. In the case of ancestral Puebloans, there could have been other reasons for their departure. Maybe nutrients in the soil became depleted due to overfarming and drought. Maybe they left to join Mesoamerican societies from Mexico with whom they had contact. In any case, Cliff Palace or Mesa Verde was abandoned because life was no longer viable there. For centuries, the site was left to wild animals, hidden and protected from the elements under its rock overhang. It may have been found multiple times by other Native American tribes, but no one lived there after it was abandoned by the ancient Puebloans. Mesa Verde was officially rediscovered in 1888 by ranchers while they were looking out for straight cattle. The discovery happened about 600 years after the site was vacated and since then has enriched our understanding of ancestral Puebloan, their way of life, their tools and techniques, their ingenuity. Today the site is the focal point of a United States National Park, the Mesa Verde National Park in Colorado. We have traveled to four continents tonight in search of our lost cities, and for tonight we have reached the end of our journey. I hope you enjoyed this adventure, and I invite you to discover and learn more. Now you can let go and sleep. And until we meet again, good night, sleep well. <laughs>